Warhammer, the final boss of tabletop gaming, hobbying, nerd-ass collectathoning, and edgelording all rolled into one. A satire of the military-industrial complex so religiously committed to the bit that Starship Troopers blushes behind the pages of its favorite alien fetish fanfiction. A game so storied, a hobby so ubiquitous, a multimedia franchise so massive that I did not know a single person who was into it until this year. Have you ever bought a new car and suddenly you realize just how many people drive that same car? My goodness, you say to yourself, it's hard to believe there's so many Hyundai Elantras on the road. That's Warhammer. The minute you know what it is, the floodgates are opened, and you realize just how often you hear and see references to it. Never had I noticed the omnipresence of the phrases more Daka, blood for the blood god, or my new personal favorite line of dialogue in the history of fiction. Come, show me what passes for fury amongst your misbegotten kind. I don't hear that one often, but my god, what a fucking taunt. Even the term Grimdark is itself a reference to Warhammer 40k's tagline. That's how influential it is. Am I so out of touch? Or is it the Brits who are wrong? That is what this video is about. See, the thing is, on paper, this should absolutely be my bag, baby. I like nerd stuff. I like goofy, over-the-top pulp fiction. I like arts and crafts, and I really like board games. How a Lovecraftian horror of all my principal interests managed to elude me for nearly 25 years is a mystery in itself, and made me initially skeptical. So I thought I would take the time to document my first few cautious sips of the Kool-Aid. After all, maybe you, the proverbial viewer, are like me. Maybe you're intrigued by the optics, but want to know what it's really all about. Maybe you have no idea what Warhammer is. Maybe you made a YouTube video about indie animation and literally recorded footage from and talked about the Astartes fan films and had no idea it was actually a real IP and for some reason thought it was French and called it a start and you're still amazed nobody has yelled at you about it considering how much people love yelling at you for inconsequential things. Probably not that last one, but whatever the case, I am here to try this infamously dense, prohibitively expensive hobby in your stead. You're welcome. A fair warning before I begin. There are two main flavors of Warhammer, Age of Sigmar and 40k. To attempt to engage with both is likely an exercise in surgically removing your social life from your once healthy psyche. Picking which you want to pursue is mostly a matter of aesthetic preferences, but since we're here doing science, I made the executive decision to stick with the more popular and therefore slightly more accessible 40k. So, the universe of Warhammer 40k is dominated by four major gods of chaos. Korn, the god of murder, Nurgle, the god of gross murder, Zinch, the god of weird murder, and Slanesh, the god of sexy murder. Slanesh is a relatively new god, because a gajillion years ago, some super advanced alien races had an awesome epic war and destroyed each other, and so these psychic space elves became the dominant civilization in the universe and had no impediments to their rapidly increasing standard of living. And since their lives were so perfect, they got so bored and so horny that they invented super psychic BDSM and the sheer metaphysical force of the extra-dimensional sensor bar it created tore the fabric of reality. Now would be a good time to mention I'm aggressively paraphrasing. So somewhere between 10 and 20,000 AD, back on Earth, humanity achieves a golden age of space exploration and colonization thanks to the implementation of AI. Science fiction fans may be ahead of the text here. Before humanity can become a new galactic superpower, the AI turns against its creators, and so begins a dark age of technology, where humans become isolated between star systems and pretty philosophically backwards. Generally standard pulp sci-fi stuff so far, but hold on, because here's where it gets weird. 
Somewhere approaching 30,000 AD, a guy called the Emperor of Mankind shows up and quickly rises the ranks to Prime Minister of Humanity. This dude is like eight feet tall and psychic and gorgeous and super duper racist. I mean a real hate boner for anything that isn't human this guy has, which makes him the perfect person to lead Earth on a celestial crusade. And that's exactly what he does, but only after making a deal with the Chaos Gods to make him 20 almost perfect Superman sons called Primarchs, who all have a fatal flaw because mythology, and then their little baby pods get launched into the far reaches of space because Superman. I'm gonna start skimming even harder because this is where the lore index becomes more of a lore omnibus. And by omnibus, I mean there's like 300 plus books about this fucking universe. So Big E, as the community calls him, starts scouring the galaxy, collecting his precious growing baby boys, so he can make them go to war for him and slowly amass an empire of a million planets. But here's the thing, he's a very bad dad, and the Chaos Gods are very tempting. So over the next couple hundred years or so, some of the Primarchs start to think about maybe having a civil war. Dad's kind of a dick, some of them say. He's afraid we'll become more powerful than him, others suggest. Yo, have you guys tried drugs yet? Asks Fulgrim. He's my favorite. Civil war breaks out pretty shortly thereafter. Big E and his good boys versus Horus, the first and favorite son, and his Black Sheep Brigade. It's very bloody, a couple of the Primarchs die, Big E gets half his face blown off and has to sit on this magic throne forever, a thousand psychic souls a day being sacrificed just to keep him alive. What happens if they stop, you ask? So does space travel. Those chaos gods, they live in this extra planar nightmare realm that makes up everything in the universe, and that's how come people can do warp speed. So it's bad. And thus we come to the phrase, in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. But this game is called 40k, not 30k, although 30k is a game too. So let's breeze through the next 10,000 years or so. The forces of chaos retreat into a wormhole and hide in the nightmare realm for several millennia. Meanwhile, humanity continues to degrade philosophically, morally, and politically. They begin to worship Big E as a god, implement a ruthless and oppressive theocracy, and focus literally all their resources into being better at war procreation, manufacturing, and sheer attrition, a non-stop cycle of existential pointlessness. Meanwhile, the power vacuum being felt across the cosmos, a bunch of big scary aliens just start jostling the puny humans for head of the celestial table. There's the horny space elves, they're still here, the bugs from Starship Troopers, these huge dumb fungus orcs who all talk like cockney goons, there's Egyptian android necromancers, space dwarves who worship the HAL 9000, horny space clown elves, just in case the pirate ones don't quite hit your particular fetish. That more or less brings us to the year 40k, where, as advertised, there's not a lot going on that isn't sheer, unbridled, wholesale slaughter. Everything is war. The absurd amount of lore that has been developed over the 30-something years this game has existed would fill, well, you know, several hundred novels. But when you boil it down, the narrative edict of all Warhammer-related fiction is to satirize the concepts of militarism, utopianism, nationalism, and more specifically jingoism, with as little subtlety and as much insanity as possible. Where this falls on the edgy, goofy, stupid, cool alignment chart is a matter of how seriously you choose to take it. Personally, I'm way over here. This stuff is bananas, and I refuse to believe it's trying to be anything else. I give it three wars and five hammers. That's a good rating. By now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, golly gee, I do love a good read. But my mother taught me that idle hands are the devil's plaything, so I'd love to hear about these arts and crafts you promised. And I'm glad you feel this way, because wow, does it take up a lot of time. At the end of the day, Warhammer is a tabletop game, but not just any tabletop game, a huge, complicated tabletop war game in which the large military force under your control must be physically represented by overpriced plastic models. And to play in tournaments and stuff, they actually have to be based and painted at least three separate colors. This is the second rabbit hole. It comes after the lore rabbit hole, but it's, it's bigger. So like, what's a burrowing animal bigger than a rabbit? 
Oh, a wombat. It's a wombat hole, this one. So the first thing you'll have to do is choose an army. For convenience, you can get one of those pre-packaged sets of the whole ass game to save you some money, but then you are shoehorned into at least starting with the armies in the core box, which in this new edition of the game that just came out is the Space Marines and the Tyranids. If you're already set on another army, of which there are a staggering 20 plus, you'll have to start from relative scratch. It is at this point, I recommend you do as I did and go to a shop where they know their shit. Most board game shops will sell games workshop stuff and usually have a guy who you can talk to about it. But there's also straight up games workshop stores just scattered about. If you live in LA, there's one in Glendale and one in Monrovia. The guys at Glendale are very nice. You couldn't pay me to haul out to Monrovia, so I have no idea what it's like there. Once you pick out a specific unit to start with from the many, many, oh, so very many choices unless you play knights, so begins the real process, the arts and crafts you were once promised all those years ago. There are starter sets for that too, as you will have to build your plastic miniatures using plastic glue, then prime them, then paint them with these little tiny paint brushes, and then base them with, well, whatever you can get your hands on. Aquarium and terrarium decorations work great, as do terrains for model train sets. GW does sell some stuff, but like all their stuff, it's way overpriced. And for a lot of people, this is where the world of Warhammer ends. Collecting, crafting, and painting these models is extremely time consuming and can constitute a hobby in itself. It's a skill that's easier to learn than it looks and harder to master than most people have the time in their entire lives to devote. A lot of the newer models are gorgeous and unreasonably detailed, and more than that, some of them are just fucking huge. Now, not to intimidate the plucky newcomer, the important bit here is easier to learn than it looks. Painting these models to a generally respectable degree is a process that took me, a casual fan of Bob Ross and otherwise completely uninitiated painter, about 90-ish minutes per model on my second try. Pick something simple to start, maybe watch a tutorial. Painting minis is a soothing, pleasant hobby, but only when you know you're not throwing away 40 plus dollars. Which leads me to the first major downside of Warhammer in concept. Not bad to get this far without one, but boy howdy is it a big roadblock. Warhammer is, and this is sugarcoating it, arm and leg expensive. It's fine in theory for hardcore fans, but especially for newcomers, a steep early investment can add a lot of pressure and ruin what should be an enjoyable hobbying experience. It's easy to feel like you can't fuck up anything at all, or else you just wasted a whole bunch of money, which can effectively defeat the purpose from the jump. Again, you're talking about a game that absolutely requires a physical collection of specific miniatures that have to be separately painted and based just to play. Thankfully, GW has, in this new edition, made all the rules and stuff free. But even so, when you crunch the numbers, unless you find really good deals on secondhand models, the raw materials for amassing a competitive standard 2000 point army, even for one of the cheaper ones, because they do not all cost the same, it will likely run you over a thousand dollars. Now, maybe you're young and you don't have a day job yet, and you're thinking to yourself, well sure, that's a lot of money to me but probably not to proper adult with a salary and stuff. I'm here to tell you, that's still a lot of money. And to prove it, here's a list of generally adult purchases you could make with $1,000. Two refrigerators. You only need one, but that shit could buy you two. Six months of car insurance. Only four if you live in Glendale. One two-way airline ticket to visit your parents for Christmas. And here's my personal favorite one half of a fairly cheap engagement ring. That's right, nerds. Do you want to experience the daily bliss of sharing your life with another? Or do you want to play with toy soldiers? Sorry, be allowed to play with toy soldiers. We haven't even talked about the game yet. Don't worry, we're almost there though, like for real. Now, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Second hands do exist, and you do not have to put together a full competitive army right away. I absolutely have not. I have 500 points of Emperor's Children, the pinkest boys, and they're not all fully painted, and nobody yelled at me when I asked to play a casual game. You can go slow, keep things chill, definitely look around for secondhand deals, substitute models when you do want to try playing, there are always options available for what is definitely not a black and white hobby. The Wombat Hole is very, very deep. 
There are dozens of GW approved Citadel paints, dozens of third parties that sell their own stuff, there's kit bashing and 3D printing and entire companies dedicated to substitutes. This internal community is massive and intense. And if you're already saying to yourself, fuck the game, I just want a bunch of cool little guys to put on my shelf. More power to you. I'm not very good at this stuff myself, but I really found it relaxing, and not a lot of things make me feel relaxed. So I'm giving Warhammer the hobby, let's say three brushes of varying size and a single paper towel, coated in an accidental collage of excess paint that turned out surprisingly aesthetically pleasing. That one will make more sense to you when you do this. Tell me, does it feel like we've spent an unreasonable amount of time slowly approaching the part of this tabletop game where you play a tabletop game? Good, because that's an apt metaphor. As an adult with a day job and social life, finding the time to get from zero to my first bare-bones 500-point game, acquainting myself, choosing an army, purchasing building, and painting models, it took me three months. For better and for worse, Warhammer is far more than just a game. But the game is still pretty cool, honestly. Warhammer is traditionally a very big game, with a lot of rules, and a lot of specific rules for every army and every unit within that army, and options within those units. So the best way I can think to do this is to just take you through my first game. I played a very small game against this guy named Gavin. You see, a brand new edition of Warhammer has just been released, as will happen every few years, and a massive change in the rules has come along with it. So here I was, wanting to learn the game, and in a way, so was he. A game of Warhammer is usually one-on-one, -on -one, with each player amassing an army of models, each of which has a designated point value. The first step is to make sure your armies are worth the same number of points. I own 500 points of Chaos Space Marines and nothing else, so we played a 500 point game. This is uncommon. Games are usually 1000 or competitive standard 2000, so the only way you can play a game at such a small army size is by basically setting up on either side of the map and just trying to kill each other. Usually there are major objectives to secure and minor objectives to earn bonus points, like say controlling points on opposite sides of the map or killing more models than your opponent does. Whatever, I don't know. I, I didn't do it, so I don't So Gavin and I set up for a basic firefight of Chaos Marines against Chaos Marines, and we rolled off to see who goes first. I did. Which is not ideal, because I had no clue what I was doing. Having a mostly melee set of units, I bum-rushed him, and then on his turn, he shot me a lot. Movement is assigned, as are a great many statistics, where the dice come in is in resolving actions. Shooting, punching, defending, and actually secondary movement are all resolved by rolling dice and hoping for high numbers. If you're a big fan of just rolling a shitload of dice, this is probably already a game for you. What's interesting is that for a game where everything from whether your bullets hit to whether they actually hurt the other guy is decided by rolling dice, the balance is delicate enough to leave room for actual strategy. This is a war game. It'd be a pretty bad one if the point wasn't to be a good commander first. Like I said, we had the same army, me and Gavin, but not the same units. He had a more balanced set of ranged support, shock troops, and defensive units, and I had a huge demon prince and a couple random frontliners built to push forward mindlessly. Why, you ask? Because I liked the models. It's valid as a strategy, and here's why. Because even with us employing wildly different game plans, Gavin and I nearly drew. He caught me with just a couple lucky rolls as I rushed down his last line of defense, the game ending when I conceded, with my last remaining model facing down his mostly unscathed last remaining unit of five. Fairly close, probably closer if I knew what stratagems were at the time. What this says to me is that anyone can pick up an at least mostly functional version of this game essentially instantly. Was it anywhere near as deep as a full 2,000 point game with objectives and stratagems and all the bells and whistles built into the now free online army indexes? No. But what it was, was fun. A lot of fun. And not just fun, but fun even with an absolute stranger. I have no doubt that there's a fixtured subsection of this fandom who are very little fun and very much sweaty, and that playing against them, especially when you're still trying to get your footing, can leave a bad taste in your mouth. 
but that didn't happen to me. I'm also sure there are unbearable edgelords who get mad if you think the lore is funny, and rich hobbyists who have too much time and money and say snide things to people with poorly painted minis. All fandoms, especially nerdy ones, are subject to douchebaggery. But for better or worse, I only have my own experience. And I haven't seen anyone like that yet. Just some nice people who were on the whole not at all sweaty or gatekeepy, and were just happy to help someone try out their favorite thing. So the tabletop game of Warhammer, I give three very pretty sets of Chessex dice, which is a very high rating, by the way, but the community, just Warhammer as a whole, I give an official seal of approval. If you have the means, I can honestly say, I do recommend getting into Warhammer, however that looks to you. Go forth, have fun out there, and death to the false emperor. Please.